Can a British falconer pass an American falconry exam? I think, I think. Now, I did try this a while back, um, but the exam is split up into different sections, and I only tried the first section, the general part of the exam. So, due to popular demand, lots of people have been asking me to do this. Uh, I'm now going to have a go at doing the second section, which is the uh, apprentice birds section of the exam. I can already see you there typing in the comments, you're not a real falconer. Can an ex-hunting falconer who decided he prefers doing displays over hunting and traditional falconry but still uses all the traditional falconry techniques to train and fly all of his birds pass an American falconry exam is just not a very good title for a YouTube video. So get over it. If you don't like it, don't watch it. You bunch of falconry Karens. And anyway, in this, ti this time I'm going to raise the stakes slightly. The last section was pretty easy for me because it was just sort of general falconry knowledge, whereas this one is specifically about uh, apprentice birds in America. Um, and I believe the main apprentice birds over in America are American kestrels and red-tailed hawks. Um, and I have not done much work with either of these species, so it, it may be a bit of a struggle for me. And to make the video a bit more entertaining, I have decided that if I get a question wrong, I'm going to eat a chilli. I'm an absolute wuss when it comes to spicy food. So I'm really not looking forward to this. Question 1. The falcon in which sexual dimorphism is found in both plumage, coloration and pattern is the A. Peregrine falcon B. American kestrel C. Jer falcon D. None of the above. Now I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. This section of the exam is about apprentice birds. So, the answer to most of these questions, I assume, is going to be either the American Kestrel or the Red-Tailed Hawk. I've not actually read the questions, so I don't even know what's going to appear. I've asked Josh to put them in a PowerPoint for me, so I've no idea what's coming up. But I'm going to say B, American Kestrel. B, correct. Two, which of these birds lacks distinctive immature plumage during their first year? A. Goshawk, B. Red-tailed hawk, C. Merlin, D. American kestrel. Um, I do believe that American kestrels look the same in their first year as they do in their uh, adult plumage, so D. American kestrel. True or false? The American kestrel is closely related to the Eurasian sparrowhawk, false. Uh, sparrowhawks are what we call the true hawks and they're the uh, occipiters, they're short wings, whereas the American kestrel is a falco. Um, it's a, a long-winged bird. False. Four. A small hawk alights nearby and immediately pumps its tail up and down several times. This tail pumping is a good indicational, is a good identification field mark of a sharp shinned hawk, American kestrel, broad-winged hawk, northern harrier. Um, to be honest, I don't have any experience with sharp shinned hawks, broad-winged hawks, and northern harriers, um, but I do know that it is quite a falcon thing to sit and sort of pump their tail. So again, I'm going to say B, American kestrel. A very small raptor hovering 20 feet above an open field is most likely a sharp shinned hawk, American kestrel, Merlin, Cooper's hog. Again, kestrels are the, the falcons that are kind of known for hovering. Um, whereas a lot of other birds, a lot of species of birds do have the ability to hover, the kestrels are kind of, kind of famous for it. So, B, American kestrel. Is every single answer on this going to be American kestrel? Although in the summer, this raptor employs a hunting style adapted to catching grasshoppers and mice, Wintering individuals often show a more typical falcon style when capturing small birds. A. Northern Harrier, B. American Kestrel, C. Broad-winged Hawk, D. Sharp-Shinned Hawk. Again, American Kestrel. Uh, these other birds are all quite a bit bigger than the American Kestrel. I don't imagine they would grow, go after uh, many small insects, uh, whereas the American Kestrels, they, they do eat a lot of insects. So, B. American Kestrel. 
The species that is most sensitive to weight fluctuations is the AJ falcon, B red-tailed hawk, C peregrine falcon, D American kestrel. Uh, again, like the previous question, um, the American kestrel is a lot smaller than all the rest of these uh, hawks on this list. So the one that is most sensitive to weight fluctuations will definitely be the American kestrel D. Eight, true or false, it is a good idea to have an American kestrel wedded to the lure prior to flying free. Oh, absolutely, I so agree with this. Um, not just American kestrels, regular kestrels. Um, I feel like it's something that a lot of people miss, um, uh, but it's beneficial in so many different ways to have your, your kestrel or American kestrel wed to a lure before flying it um, free. Um, before you've got it wed to prey even. Um, by wedding it to that lure, it means that before you even start hunting with the, the hawk, you can build up all of her fitness, stooping and passing her to the lure. Um, really good if you don't have time or access and can't go out and hunt, or if you have an unsuccessful hunting day and you can't get um, any prey for your bird, um, then it's really easy to just get that lure out. She still gets a bit of exercise, she still gets her fun of chasing and capturing something um, and also in emergency situations it's so much easier to be able to just drop that lure on the floor and have your kestrel come straight back down to it uh, and then making a pick up so yeah absolutely true it's a good idea to have an American kestrel wedded to the lure prior to flying free when caring for the when caring for an American kestrel the falconer, the falconer must be particularly attentive to a, weight management, B, other avian predators, C, injuries due to baiting, D, all of the above. Um, I don't think this is specific to American kestrels. I think this is, you could say this about every single type of uh, bird of prey used in falconry. Uh, D, all of the above. A trait of the American kestrel in the wild that carries over and becomes a vice when it is trained in falconry is A, soaring, B, warbling, C, bowsing, D, carrying, becomes a vice. I imagine that means, I imagine that means it's negative. Becomes a vice. I'm not entirely sure what they mean by that. I'm, I'm going to assume uh, they talk about something negative. Soaring, definitely not. Wonderful to see a kestrel soaring in the wild and in captivity. Warbling. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, bowsing, that's when they, they're drinking, so of course you, you don't want to not see your kestrel drinking. Uh, carrying, I'm going to say carrying, they, they pick up and carry away the food in the wild. Uh, that would be incredibly annoying if they were to doing that, uh, start doing that in captivity with the falconer. Um, you won't be able to make in and go and trade off or pick up your kestrel and reward her for making kill. Uh, if she's picked up and carried the food off. Uh, she's then gonna eat the food, probably sat in a tree or something, and then you have to wait until the next day when she's hungry again to get her back. So definitely D, carrying. Yeah. 11, traditional falconry equipment items not routinely used with American kestrels include A, bells, B, B, hood, C, C, traditional jesses, or D, all of the above. Um, well, with a bird this small, you have to really sort of think about how much equipment you're putting on that on that hog. Um, you don't want to weigh her down and make her lift too much weight. Um, I don't I don't know many people that hood. Um, I do have a friend who's got um, an American Kestrel cross peregrine, and he hoods that. But I don't know of anybody who hoods an actual American Kestrel. I wouldn't put bells on a Kestrel. Um, and traditional dresses. I'm just going to say D, all of the above. Yeah. True or false? In the wild, a red-tailed hawk will take neither game birds nor passerines. Uh, false? Yeah. 13. The sex of a red-tailed hawk can be predicted in most cases by A, weight and size, B, eye colour, C, coloration of plumage, D, none of the above. So the eye colour between male and female red-tailed hawks is, is the same. Um, coloration of plumage, they don't really show any differences between the male and the female. Um, but like most 
or nearly all birds of prey. Uh, the females can be up to a third larger, uh, so quite a bit heavier and visibly bigger. So it's going to be A, weight and size. True or false, there is no sexual dimorphism in the red-tailed hawk. False. The previous question just was asking about that. There is no sexual dimorphism in the red-tailed hawk. False, because the females are larger. Yeah. True or false? Red-tailed hawks only nest in trees. Uh, I'm going to say that's false. Um, I don't see why a bird would, a bird of prey even would say, no, I'm only nesting in this tree and nowhere else. Uh, I imagine they nest on cactuses or cacti, however you say it, in some of the southern states um, and uh, even uh, big rocks and cliff faces and things like that, so, uh, false. Yeah. 16. In New York State, red-tailed hawks will lay their eggs in A. February, March, B. March, April, C. April, May, D. May and June. Um, well, I don't have much experience with red-tailed hawks, but I am going to assume that they are the same as most other birds of prey in that they're seasonal breeders um, and they lay their eggs so that they hatch in time for the summer so they don't have to work really hard to try and keep their chicks really warm through the winter because they're growing up through the, the warm summer months. So I'm going to say uh, B, March and April. Yeah. When their nest tree is climbed by a human, red-tailed hawks usually A, attack the intruder B. Disappear and permanently desert the nest. C. Utter vocal cries from a distance. D. Sit tightly on the nest. Okay. Um, so, from an evolutionary point of view, that red-tailed hawk doesn't really understand what the human is or what the human is doing. It's just it's a much larger animal and therefore could be a predator to her. It's not going to be very useful for her to try and fight off or defend her chicks from a much larger predator than herself, she has the ability to go on and reproduce in the wild and make more chicks. Um, those chicks are just not at that stage yet. They're, it's awful to say, but those chicks are maybe not as important as a proven breeding adult red tail in the wild. So evolutionary wise, it doesn't make sense for her to stay because if it's a much bigger predator and it's going to kill the chicks anyway, then it's most likely going to be able to kill her. So I'm going to say that she will utter vocal cries from a distance. C. Yeah. 18. In the wild, red-tailed hawks generally fledge how many young? One, two, three or four. Uh, I'm going to go with what is most common for a lot of species of birds, which is B2. 19. The red-tailed ayas generally leaves the nest for the first time at two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Hmm. Leaves the nest for the first time. Um, definitely not two weeks. Definitely not four weeks. It's a toss up between six weeks and eight weeks. Um, I reckon by six weeks they're probably starting to branch out. Is that what it means by leaves a nest for the first time? Or does it mean like leaves a nest? No, for the first time it's just they're, they're just branches. Branches is what we call birds when they're They've started to sort of hop around. They're not old enough or strong enough to leave the nest yet. They can't fly properly yet. They start start to just sort of hop around the, the branches on the tree. That's what we call them, branches. Um, I'm going to say C, six weeks. During the fall migration, the best place to trap a passage red-tailed hawk in New York with a bow net or mist net is A, atop a ridge running northeast to southwest, B, atop a ridge running from east to west. C, in an agricultural valley with interlocking field and forest. D, on the beach. During the fall migration, the 
best place to trap? Well, I, I, I can't imagine that the, the best place to trap a bird would be low down. So I'm going to rule out a valley. Or the beach. A or B. Um, if they're migrating, then they're, they're most likely going south for the winter, where it's going to be warmer for them rather than staying further north. Um, so I'm going to say atop a ridge running from northeast to southwest. I guess that would give you the most sort of amount of time whilst the bird is flying over it rather than a ridge running from east to west. You've got that sort of one opportunity if the bird hop goes over that ridge because it's going to cross its path. I'm going to say A. Uh, a top of ridge running from northeast to southwest. Yeah. That's it. I didn't know the answer to that one, that was, uh, I just had to try and work it out because we don't trap birds here in the UK. Um, it's actually uh, legal to do that. 21. True or false, there are many varieties of red-tailed hawks in Northern America. Uh, true. I can't remember the exact number. I do believe it is sort of the mid-teens. So probably around like 15, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe probably a little bit less than that. Uh, but I can't tell you the exact number. But yeah, there's lots of different, um, what I would call subspecies of red-tailed hawk. So true. Yeah. 22. The species best suited for taking rabbits is the A. Merlin, B. Red-tailed hawk, C. Peregrine falcon, D. Any of the above. Uh, well, a Merlin is way too small to take a rabbit. Um, and just not adapted for it. A peregrine falcon, um, they're sort of aerial hunters, they hunt other birds, so you'd be taking uh, game birds and uh, other types of bird like that with um, peregrine falcons, so the, the most likely one that you would take a rabbit with, or hunt a rabbit with, is a red-tailed hawk. So, uh, B. Yep. 23. To properly exercise a red-tailed hawk, A. Block it out in a place where it will bait continuously. B. Stoop it to the lure repeatedly, 20 to 50 times. C. Fly it multiple times on a creance. D. Take it into the field and hook with it. Um, well, you don't want to block a bird out where it's going to bait continuously. That's not going to be good for their, their feet constantly baiting uh, or their feather condition. Um, we don't want our birds to be baiting whilst they're on the block. Um, Stooping a red-tailed hawk to a lure uh, could be quite interesting. I don't know of anybody that has done that. I don't imagine that they would be very good at that uh, at all. Um, <coughs> flying, fly it multiple times on a creance. Um, yeah, that would help to maybe build up a bit of fitness, but that's something we only really do in the early stages of training. Um, the best way to properly exercise a red-tailed hawk is to take it to the field and hunt with it. The best way to exercise it is to let it do what it naturally does. So, D. Yeah. Some ass hawks become so aggressive when they mature that they should only be taken as passengers. The species that displays this behaviour to the greatest degree is the A. Goss hawk, B. Harris hawk, C. Red-tailed hawk, D. Prairie falcon. Um, I'm going to say uh, a C red-tailed hawk. Yes. 25. Your imprint Ias red-tailed hawk has attacked a member of your hunting party. She binds to the person's body with both feet and hangs. Some of her talons have drawn blood and there is a danger of serious injury. The best way to remove her is to pull the hind talon of each foot backwards and slide the foot forwards. Pour water on the hawk. Throw the garnished lure or live pigeon on the ground. Grab the hawk by its head and squeeze. Um, well, once a bird has bound to something, it's really not the best idea to try and start pulling on the toes because their, their tendons lock into place. They're not like our tendons that allow us to smooth, uh, they're all smooth and they allow us to open and close our fingers nice and easily, that I was nice and glide over each other nice and easily. Um, 
on a bird of prey, or I think most birds actually, uh, their tendons are in a sheath and the inside of the sheath is serrated and the tendon is serrated, so once they've closed those toes, they, they lock into place. Um, and if you go and start touching those toes, um, this is something you will have to find out the, in a very hard way when you start working with birds. If you go and touch those toes once it grabs you, all they're gonna do is get tighter. Uh, it's gonna be even more painful. Pour water on the hawk. Don't pour water on your hawk. Don't do that. Um, throw the garnished lure or live pigeon on the ground. Um, this is a method that I have used in the past. Um, not, not whilst out hunting and not whilst the bird has been aggressive. I've just had a, a, a bird grab me out of excitement um, and the way I managed to get out of it was to get somebody to throw a, a chick to the side, a day old chick, dead one, uh, to the side so that the bird went down and, and took that instead. But the issue with that is that the bird was being a bit sticky footed so the feet were still locked into me. Um, so then he tried flying for the chick and he was just like tugging my hand around uh, with all these talons stuck in my hand. That was very painful. Uh, grab and squeeze by its, grab the hawk by its head and squeeze. Uh, don't do that. Don't squeeze your bird's head. Um, yeah, <laughs> there, there will be a reason that this bird is being aggressive um, and a reason that she has bound to something. It's all natural to her. Um, if she's showing these behaviours, it's something that the falconer um, or the trainer, whoever is training or owns the bird, needs to sort out. Um, don't grab your hawk by its head and squeeze it for doing something that she naturally wants to do. Um, what I would personally do is not on this list um, because the way that the tendons are, it basically creates an uh, automatic perching system in the birds, built into the bird's leg. So when they land on a branch and their legs bend, the toes close and lock into place. When the bird goes to take off and leaves the branch, they flap their wings, their body extends and it opens up their legs and that then opens up the toes. So when the leg is closed up, the clothes are toasted. When the leg is stretched out, the feet, the toes are stretched out. So to, to get the bird off, um, I would actually try to just straighten up her legs um, so that it opens up those toes naturally. But that is not on this list. Um, don't touch the toes, that's gonna to be painful. Don't pour water on your hawk. That's not gonna be good for anybody. If she proves some of that in. Um, don't squeeze your hog's head. I'm going to say throw the garnished lure onto the ground. D! <laughs> D! <laughs> Grab your hog's head and squeeze it, really! <laughs> don't do that! I certainly wouldn't do that. Oh, for goodness sake. I'm gonna have to bite into a chili now. Mm. Here we go. Lesson learned. If my hog grabs me again, I'm gonna squeeze it by the head. I'm not gonna do that, that's, that's a lie. Oh, I don't wanna do this, I'm a proper wuss when it comes to spicy food. How much of it should I eat? Let's just go for it a medium bite to begin with. <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> oh, that's not very nice. Oh, don't like that. Oh, I should have got this in my glass of milk. Oh, that's not nice. Oh, it's not as bad as I was expecting, but... Oh, it burns. Oh, dear. Oh, my belly's warm now. Next. True or false? If your red-tailed hawk misbehaves... No, Charlie, go down. If your red-tailed hawk misbehaves, 
it should be disciplined immediately so that it will associate the punishment with the aberrant behaviour. No, don't do that. But I've lost confidence in this quiz now. Now it's saying, telling people to squeeze their hawk by the head. Um, no, the best forms of training is uh, reward the behaviours you want, ignore the behaviours you don't. We want to be doing positive reinforcement, not positive punishment. So, so if your Red Tail Talk misbehaves, it should be disciplined immediately. False. Don't do that. Yes. True or false? Aggression by a Red Tail Talk may not be manifested until its second or third year. Oh, God. Um, God, I don't know. Um, well, I guess they could maybe become, uh, become a bit more aggressive when they're sexually mature, but I don't see why a first year red tailed hawk couldn't become aggressive. It all kind of depends on the way it's handled, the situation it's in, and that individual hawk. Some of them are just naturally more aggressive than others. Um, so I don't see why a first year red tailed hawk wouldn't become aggressive. So I'm going to say aggression by red tailed hawk may not be manifested until it's... I'm going to say false. True? Oh, for goodness sake. Oh no, I should have gone with the <laughs> sexual maturity. I don't want to do that again. <laughs> But now I've made it even worse for myself because now it's at the bit with all the seeds in it and apparently the seeds are the worst bit. Oh my word. Oh, it hurts. <laughs> I don't like that. Oh, Charlie, get off the table. Well, the people who are watching this probably like spicy food. Probably thinking, what a wuss. I don't even know what kind of chilies they are, just called mixed chilies. It says medium on the packet, it doesn't feel like a medium to me. Ah, oh. I really don't like spicy food. <laughs> oh, my tongue hurts. My belly is so warm. Oh, goodness me. Oh, I don't like this. Oh, whose idea was this? That was so much worse than the first bite. <gasps> oh. I got it stuck in all my teeth as well. Well, dearie me. Is this good entertainment? I'm not doing this again. <gasps> oh. <laughs> I'm such a loss. 28. Which raptor has the reputation for being the easiest to man? Oh, I don't bloody know. I'm not eating another chili, for goodness sake. A, Charlie, you're not part of this quiz. Go off the table. A, a passage goshawk. B, a passage prairie falcon. C, a passage red tailed hawk. D, a passage sharp shinned. I don't know. I don't have experience with many of these birds. But in my experience, the I always find that the, the falcons are a lot easier to man than the hawks and the buzzards. So I'm going to say B, a passage prairie falcon. Oh, for Oh, I even said at the start of this that the answer is probably most likely going to be either Red Tailed Hawk or Money from Cash Tour. Should have. Oh, for sake.
Obviously, so that one wasn't as bad because I didn't have any of the seeds in it. 29. The reason to select an American Kestrel over Red-Tailed Hawk as your first bird is they need to be fed less often. They are less likely to carry. They're easier to keep healthy. None of the above is true. D, none of the above is true. Smaller birds are a lot more difficult to deal with than bigger birds. D, yes, thank goodness for that. 30, the bird which is most tolerant of the cold is A, the red-tailed hawk, B, the Harris hawk, C, the Appomattox falcon, D, none of the above. Harris hawks are not very good at the cold. They come from the Southern America. It's very warm, they're kind of known for being susceptible to conditions associated with colder climates. Aplomado falcon's quite a small falcon, not going to deal, deal well with the cold. So A, red-tailed hawk, the most tolerant of the cold. Yes. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Oh, that was warm. 31. The hunting style of a wild red-tailed hawk is best described as A, waiting on, B, attack from above, C, perch and wait, D, and on the above. Waiting on is um, when you go sort of game hawking, so you'll have the bird soar high up in the air, either a falcon or an eagle, even buzzards could do it, waiting for you to flush out the prey. Once you've flushed out the prey, they'll uh, stoop down and take the kill. Uh, attack from above is, a again, a, a very much a, a falcon, type style of hunting. The buzzards and the hawks, especially the, the, the buzzards, even though it's called a red-tailed hawk, it's actually a buzzard, it's a beauty. So buzzards are much more of a perch and wait kind of bird. Uh, C, perch and wait. C. Oh God, I need to hurry up with this now. Oh, my nose is dribbling now. Taking an IAS red-tailed hawk from the nest is preferred over trapping a passage red tail hog because they're less likely to become aggressive, they're easier to keep healthy, they are more natural hunters, none of the above. Taking an IAS red tail hog from the nest is preferred over trapping. I don't know why you would do that. Why is taking an IAS from the nest preferred over trapping a passage? I don't know. D, none of the above. I don't understand this question. Surely it's better for the natural natural wild populations to be capturing passage birds. You don't want to take an eye ask because the danger is going to start to imprint on people and then you can't release it back into the wild and have it breed with other birds. Whereas if you capture a passage bird, once you've spent a year with that bird and it's more mature and it's, it's gone through a moult with you, and you release it, it could go on and breed. So I don't understand why taking an eye ask would be preferred over trapping a passage red tail. So Dean on the above. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> My nose is dribbling. 33. Red-tailed hawks are commonly trained A, using operant conditioning technique, technician, te A, using operant conditioning techniques, B, to stoop to the lure repeatedly, C, to hunt quail, D, none of the above. Um, you don't want a red-tailed hawk stooping to the lure. Uh, hunting quail, yeah, but I, I feel like it's a bit small for a red-tailed hawk. I think they'd probably prefer something a bit more substantial, like a, a bigger game bird, like a pheasant or a rabbit or hare. Um, using operant conditioning techniques. That's how we should be training every single bird or every single animal. Um, so, A. Yes. 34. Four, 34. The hunting style of a kestrel most closely resembles a goshawk, a peregrine falcon, a jerk falcon, a merlin. I'm going to say a merlin, they're both micro falcons. Yes, D. 35. Male red tailed hawks are preferred over females because females are too clumsy to take squirrels. Males are more agile and take jackrabbits easier. Males are easier to man, none of the above. I don't know. I disagree with all of them. D, none of the above. Yes. 
36 year American Kestrel is best suited to hunt quail, starlings, English sparrows, B and C above. Well, definitely not quail. A quail is way too big for an American Kestrel. Starlings, yeah. English sparrows. Do you get English sparrows in America? Is that a trick question? I don't know. I don't know anything about sparrows or English sparrows. Do you get English sparrows in America? I feel like B and C is quite obvious. If it's saying B and C above, that's quite specific. It probably means that that's the correct answer. But I don't know if you get English sparrows over in America. That might be really stupid of me to say. I just don't know if you, I don't know. If it's called an English sparrow. Surely we, they're in England. I would say B starlings. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> I mean, that is all dribbling. I think, I think. <laughs> Why am I doing this? I'm a lemon and herb kind of guy. I don't like spicy food. <coughs> I guess you do get English sparrows in America. I think it's why I call it English sparrows and not just sparrows. A field aid. A field aid that, oh, my nose is triply. Oh, well, lovely, a big-ass big bogey came out. A field aid that helps identify the American Kestrel is A, hovering, B, bobbing up the head, C, pumping the tail up and down upon landing, D, all the above. Yeah, hovering, bobbing the head, tail going up and down is something that all, the, all, all, all those things that Kestrels do. So D, all of the above. Yes. Last question. Uh, 38. The raptor most likely to kill its prey with its powerful grip is A, Jack. B, Jerkin. C, Redtail Talk. D, Kestrel. A Jack is a male Merlin. Jerkin is a... a a Jir falcon, Kestrel again is a falcon, so all three of those are falcons. They don't really kill things with their powerful grip, they stoop at them out of the air and wallop them with a load of force. So see, the red-tailed hawk grabs its food, kills it with his grip. Yes! Done! <laughs> no more chilies. Hooray! <laughs> oh. 34 out of 38. It's not too bad, I'm quite happy with that. So, oh. I've had a few glasses of milk now. I'm such a drama queen. Right. Um. So in order to pass the American exam, you need to get, I think, 80%. Um, so that's 30 correct questions. So to answer the question, can a British falconer pass the American falconer exam for round two? The answer is still yes, 34 out of 38. Um, so that's first section and second section that I have passed. Uh, there are more sections to this exam. 
So if you would like to see me do the other sections, then make sure you leave a comment. Um, hopefully this has helped, hopefully this answered some questions that you might be wondering uh, if you're going to do uh, or planning to do your American exam, then please do let me know in the comments. Um, if you've done it, let me know how well you did. Um, leave the video a like, make sure to subscribe, and thank you for watching.